are very happy to, to have uh, Anne-Sophie Beck Knudsen. I see from uh, your CV that you, you are starting a position as assistant professor in Copenhagen, but this year you are at Harvard. I don't know how much you can enjoy Harvard. Are you based there physically or you're visiting oh. online? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm participating in everything online and then I will visit the University of Zurich um, this fall. As a okay, so you, you're you doing a, a fine tour of nice uh, institutions. Yeah. Uh, you're a fine uh, young economic uh, historian. You have a very nice paper, The Bounty of the Sea, that just came out in uh, Journal of Economic Growth. And you have this very intriguing, interesting paper for a lot of us, which mixes uh, economic history, economics of migration, and the economics of culture with the case study of uh, selective emigration on cultural uh, dimensions and its long-run effect on the societies of the sending countries. So we are very happy to host you. You know the timeline, I think you, you have 45 minutes, probably with some interruptions by our panelists uh, for clarification questions, and then we have 15 minutes left uh, for discussion after that. So without further ado, you're welcome to, to present your paper and share your slides. Thanks so much for having me. I finally get to meet the economics of migration crowd and I'm very excited for that. So today I will talk about cultural selection in migration and the consequences that this can have on migrant sending populations. So Selection is a core topic in economics, but especially so in research on migration, which I don't have to motivate in this crowd, I think. Because looking at how migrants differ from people who choose not to migrate, not only sheds light on the underlying drivers and barriers to migration, more than that, it also matters for the consequences of migration. So if you have selection in migration on a certain trade, then it naturally follows that migration can lead to a change in the composition of these traits in the sending, especially in the sending population. So the most famous example of this is the literature on the brain drain, which some of the organizers of this seminar are particularly known for. But so in economics, this topic of migration has been uh, studied with a focus naturally on economic payoffs, skills and wealth. It's a huge literature on this with uh, this uh, one that I cite here that is uh, based in the economic or the historical period that I study. Um, but we also know that this is not everything that matters. So for instance, uh, migration often involves uh, tearing existing social bonds. And we know from psychology that migration can often be involved uh, or associated with feelings of social and existential loss, especially if, uh, when people feel very connected to the places that they come from. So this has uh, motivated one of the more prominent hypotheses in this literature in social psychology, which states that people with collectivist traits, so that is people who are more reliant on the social group for a sense of identity and support, that they will prefer to stay within this social group and thereby have a lower propensity to migrate. And vice versa with people, uh, for people with individualistic traits who feel less connected to the social groups that uh, they are surrounded by, they will have a higher propensity to migrate when there, for instance, is an economic payoff uh, to doing so. So this is obviously depending on or dependent on, on the general uh, flows of migration away from this group. But so to the extent that these traits that are linked to individualism and collectivism, to the extent that these are portable and transmitted across generations, which is how we think about most cultural traits, then a potential implication is that we would see cultural change in migrant sending districts towards stronger collectivism. And this is not just important in terms of understanding the underlying drivers of migration, it can also have economic impacts. So we know from a growing literature in economics that, that these traits that are associated with collectivism and individualism are linked with economic outcomes. So for instance, they matter for the scale of cooperation and also the diffusion of ideas and technology. So if we have an underlying change in the distribution of these traits in the society due to migration, then this can have wider societal implications. So what I do in this paper is that I first examine the role of these collectivist traits in shaping their propensity to migrate. And then I draw implications for migrant sending districts. And to do this, I use the age of mass migration as a historical case. And I look at Scandinavia and I will get back to describing this period. 
and I used individual level data on nearly everyone who stayed and everyone who immigrated at this point in time. So my paper contributes to three literatures. So one is obviously the literature on selection and drivers of migration, including a recent work on culture and networks. I also contribute to the literature on effects of migration in sending places, which is not as big as the literature on, on effects of migration in receiving places. And then finally, I also contribute to the literature on this particular economic trait, uh, collectivism, individualism, uh, which, as I mentioned, is, is growing in the literature of economics. Right. So let me just give a little more detail about this uh, historical event that I'm studying. So here you can see the trends in immigration in Scandinavia at this point in time, both over time and across places. So migration in this time period took off in the 1860s, and this was following uh, the shift from uh, sail to steamship technology, which dramatically reduced the cost of sailing to the US. All of a sudden it became available or economically feasible for a lot of people in Europe to travel to the US, and more than 40 million people did so. And in Scandinavia, we had some of the highest immigration rates of this period, along with Italy and Ireland. And in total, around 25% of the average populations left from Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, yeah, and uh, so there was a lot of variation across, uh, across districts, and also over time, it peaked in the 1880s, and then it sort of died down towards the start of the First World War. So uh, these migrants, they were attracted by economic prospects and freedom in the U.S. So there's research that documents that upward mobility was higher in the U.S. at this point in time than in Europe. And the economy was also more equal. So you had a selection, on, uh, a selection of poorer people from Europe, what we call negative uh, selection out of Europe to the U.S. But what is interesting to this paper is that not all poor people left to study in the US and other places in the new world. So uh, what I'm interested in here is to, to see if other factors also played a role in determining who migrated and who, who stayed. All right, so to do this, I rely on two major data sources. So one is a collection of population censuses from this time period. So here I have information on the entire population in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden at different points in time. So uh, this contains the information at the individual level, uh, but also at the family level. So you have names and how they were living together, places of birth and also residence of, of, of places of residence, of course, and then occupations. And another set of uh, data sources is a collection of passenger lists. So here I uh, rely, so, so these are lists from the ships that carried migrants across the Atlantic, uh, most of them to the US. And from 1867 and 1868, all of these shipping companies, they were required to report the personal details on everyone on board these uh, ships to the authorities. And if they failed to do so to the satisfaction of, of the authorities, they would be put out of business. So this means that we have a lot of information on everyone who left in this time period. And uh, so all of these sources have been digitized, but they're quite scattered. And what I do is I collect them and merge them into one large database and harmonize some of the most important variables. And I end up with a database of more than 1.4 million immigrants, uh, which corresponds to around 70% of the total outflow of people in this time period. I checked that they are representative. So they're not, so I don't have information on everyone, but I have information on almost everyone. And then I can also cross check them with the censuses and see that the numbers that I have in these migration lists, they actually predict changes across censuses in the number of people with the same names, birth year, and places of residence. So although they're not complete, they are representative of the actual uh, migration flows. All right. Okay, so with this data, I need cultural proxies, and I construct three proxies of collectivist households. So the first, uh, let me just uh, talk about this number two and number three first. So uh, one here is, is uh, an indicator of people living in extended versus nuclear family structures. So the nuclear family just consists of parents and children. Whereas uh, if you live in an extended family, that would include family members beyond those people. And another proxy is 
an indicator of intergroup marriage, which, which here is uh, equals one if the two or a couple or uh, the two partners in a couple uh, uh, come from the same neighborhood or if they're born in the same district in, in Scandinavia, sorry. So these two are quite standard in the literature. So they are acknowledged manifestations of a collectivist culture because they are in accordance with this preference for living in, in more extended uh, and dense uh, social networks. The challenge or the, the downside of these uh, proxies is that they are um, uh, constrained choices. So for instance, you can't just choose who you want to marry. That person has to want to marry you as well. And they are also determined by other things. Uh, so here I, uh, for that reason, my main proxy in this uh, paper is an indicator of giving your children uh, common first names. So giving a name is a more pure choice and it's, hence that's my preferred proxy. So since this is kind of new to economics, I will just describe it briefly. So the proxy is based on a long-standing literature and research in social psychology. And here it has been acknowledged or there's wide agreement that giving your children common or uncommon first names reflect underlying cultural differences in individualism and collectivism. So the idea here is that if you give your child a common or name that is common within the group, uh, that you're part of that signals uh, conformity and a wanting to fit in to this group. Whereas giving your child an uncommon name or name that is not recognized or popular within this group signals that you're your own person or signals some sort of independence from this group. So, so this association between this trait and the giving an, of common or uncommon first names has been found in surveys of both parents and children in various uh, research. And I add to that and do additional validation checks. So that's part of, I won't go into too much uh, detail here, but a part of my paper do these validation checks where first of all, oh, I cross check with uh, global survey data and find that uh, differences in name giving today, both across and within countries in the Western world, they are strongly correlated with differences in, in these traits that are associated with individualism and collectivism and more so than other cultural dimensions that we usually care about. I also do a historical validation check where I look at differences in name giving over time in Sweden in the 18th and 19th century and see that in decades and places where you give your children more uncommon first names, you tend to have a wider use of singular pronouns. So like the pronouns like I and mine and me in newspapers rather than we, our, and us. And this is what I, uh, this has uh, been used in, in other research as well as some sort of re reflection of individualistic versus collectivist uh, language use. So how do I measure this at, in the historical time period? Well, I measure the commonness of first names as the log share of a birth group uh, that carries the same first name. Uh, and birth groups here are defined by birth decade uh, birth district. Uh, so these are the districts that you saw in the map that I showed earlier. So at the subnational level and then gender, of course. And just keep in mind that I do all of this at the subnational level, but I nevertheless, I just want to give you a few examples of what these names were at this point in time. So this figure just gives you the, uh, in the earlier census that I have for each country, you can see the three most popular uh, boys and girls names in the entire country and then examples of more uncommon names, which here will be the 30th, the 40th, and the 50th most uh, popular first name. So what we see here is first of all, that at this point in time, uh, there was an extreme concentration on a few popular first names. So you would have more than 10% of all children would carry the same first name. And this then, it drops quite quickly, these shares when you move towards like the top 10 and the top 20s, names and it's not because the names that I list here as uncommon, uh, funny or strange in any way, uh, they're all names that are quite common uh, in Scandinavia today. So I have several cousins and a sister up here. So they're, they're used quite widely um, today too, right? Can I ask a question? So these names are transmitted also, uh, say, in Italy, for instance, the grandfather first name is usually given to the grandchildren or 
uh, even in the US, sometimes the, the children have the, exactly the same name. Do you have evidence that this can happen? Yeah, yeah, I have evidence of that. So I, I also construct, like, because of the detail of my data, I can construct a proxy for that too, or like an indicator of that. So yeah, it, it's definitely something that was very common. Uh, I know that, so it was quite common, and I've spoken with names researchers on this, and they say that when you wanted to escape this tradition, then you would start giving uh, not the first name, but maybe the second or third name of, for instance, the grandfather to your kids. So like you could look for more, more or less common names within uh, if, if, your, if your grandfather, for instance, had several first names. But at some point, they also abandoned this uh, tradition. And it's something that I can account for in my analysis. So, so actually giving, uh, considering the second name can be another important uh, trait of individualistic attitude in this. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's actually true. I don't do that in the analysis as it, as it is right now. I, I forgot to say this, but in the baseline analysis, I rely on just the very first name and construct commonness measures on that. But I also do robustness checks on the entire name. So people would, you know, on average, people would have 1.7 names in my sample. So yeah, I can do various things there. It's not something that's driving the, the results, but yeah. And I think it's also interesting because like some of giving your child a name that is uh, used by someone else in your family can, can reflect other traits that could actually be quite interesting to study on their own. So, okay. All right, so uh, moving on to the empirical analysis. just. Yeah. Uh, so you could I ask another question. So to, yeah. to what extent does the variation you explored in first names come from within municipalities and across municipalities? So I'm just like a bit like I'm, I'm wondering to what extent, you know, less common names reflect economic, you know, development or exposure to, to the, the modern world in a way more trade networks. Yeah. Or that. You learn yeah, about new very... names and that's why people, you know, develop a preference for these names. So yeah. You have some yeah, that's... background statistics, that would be nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually, a, uh, yeah, that's a good suggestion. I don't have, uh, I don't have like over or aggregate statistics on this. I just, I, I know that the top name is almost the same in all districts, uh, but it's something I, I can look into. So most of my analysis is based on uh, within group differences. So where I try to rule out all of these confounding uh, mechanisms, but yeah, I could look into having a, a graph or like some numbers on this. Okay, so going to the analysis, I just want to give you an overview of my empirical analysis in case I don't make it through everything and just to provide you with some structure of what it is that I do. So first I look at selection in a cross section. So here that is whether uh, people from collectivist households were on average less likely to migrate. And then I look at who migrates when and under what circumstances. And here the expectation is that selection can be stronger or weaker. And that in situations where the social costs of migration were lower, then you would also have lower selection. So that would be a higher propensity uh, of collectivist people to move as well. So that would be if these people move in moving groups or move when there are already established networks broad in the US, for instance. And third, I see, or I, I study what happens when they reach the destination, and here it's the U.S. because that's where 70% of the people went. So here they're removed from, from the social structures in Scandinavia, and I'm then interested in looking at how they establish new networks if they move to places where there are other Scandinavians or if they assimilate into society and move to places where there's a mix of nationalities. Right, and then finally I have an analysis of the long-run impact in migrant sending districts and this is where I'm interested in, in whether these places become more close-knit and individual oh, and collectivist as a result of migration. And this is using contemporary data as the outcome. Okay, so to study overall selection into migration, I construct a number of linked samples. So common for all of these samples is that I start with boys that were below the age of 15 in any of the earlier censuses that I have. And then I determine if they eventually migrate or stay by linking them to the passenger list and the most recent census that I have. So the most recent census would be in 1901 or 1910. So this is towards the end of, of the period of mass migration. 
or at least where migration was quite low compared to when migration was at its high. So, so my you, sorry, yeah. can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, is it possible that uh, uncommon names are more likely misspelled in passenger lists so you are unable to match them? Yeah, so uh, in general, uh, we know from economic historians in Scandinavia that names were quite accurately spelled. Uh, and there was also high literacy at this point in time. I do, so my linking strategy is based on some, uh, I allow uh, for them to be misspelled. And also in my other analysis, I can also check that my results hold with the phonetic spelling of first names. And even I can look at abbreviations. I even have an analysis where I just look at the first letter because I see patterns there as well. So it's definitely, it's, it's yeah, great. Okay, so my linking variables here would be country, the name, birth year, district, and then the district of birth or residence. So a challenge here is that, first of all, so okay, I, there are two challenges. So one challenge is that I don't know the birthplace of most immigrants. So uh, there will be some faulty links if people moved since the time that I observed them in the census, then I am unable to link them. So we have research that documents that people who immigrated did not that often move before they did so, that they only people tended to move once in life. Uh, but nevertheless, it can be an issue. So for that reason, I construct several link samples that also disregard this kind of information. And also I construct a link sample on the very small sample that I have where I do know the, the place of birth of these people. Another challenge is that it's easier to link people with uncommon names, and that's obviously a problem. So the fact that I try to link immigrants and stayers jointly minimizes this a bit, but I also do analysis and linking in the aggregate in groups, which accounts for all immigrants, which as robustness checks, which I will get back to in a bit. So it's just to acknowledge that there are these worries and then to calm you guys, that's, uh, they are not a problem for my analysis. All right, so with my link samples, I estimate this model. So I relate the act of migration to a set of proxies of collectivism in the household of these men or in the childhood households of these men. And then also a number of individual level controls and also household controls and then birth district by birth decade fixed effects, right? And these are my main results. So here you see that across these proxies that I have of collectivism, you will have a lower propensity to migrate later in life for the men that I'm able to, or the boys that I'm able to match. And the coefficients actually account for a significant share of the mean likelihood of immigration in this uh, time period. And they are quite robust to different controls. So individual characteristics are here, the number of brothers, the birth order fixed effects, family size, also the uncommonness of last names and household controls, or, and also this uh, indicator of receiving a name from someone else in your family. Uh, household controls include past migration behavior of parents, and also their socioeconomic status. Several measures of socioeconomic status, like their his class, or the class of type of work that they do, and also the number of servants that are employed in the household, stuff like that, if they rely on poor relief, stuff like that. Right? I conduct several robustness checks on these results. So I can use alternative measures of first names, first name commonness, for instance. So these, my robustness checks are mainly, they're mainly meant uh, to check the robustness of the first name commonness measure or the, the results that are using that measure. So for instance, I can look at the first name or the uh, first name commonness of the oldest brother in the household. Uh, so that, that sort of gets said that this is a household effect and not a sibling effect. I can also look at the distribution of names from the last decade because it is difficult for parents to predict the distribution of, of names in, in their local environment, but this does not impact the results. As I mentioned, phonetic spelling and also different uh, measures of commonness. Um, I can also include additional fixed effects. So here, actually uh, fixed effects for the actual first name so that I only use variation over time and space in the commonness of this name. Dummies for last names, municipality of birth and father's occupations. And then the most important robustness checks here is a group level analysis where I include all immigrants and stayers. I can actually just show you those results. So these are the same data that I had before, but now collapse. So for a group, 
that shares the same birth decade, uh, birth district, and first name. I can link that to uh, the passenger list and then calculate the immigration rate of these people and then regress that on the commonness of this name and the other control variables that I have in my individual level analysis. Now they're just averages across these groups. So if there's something particular about boys named Hans, if they're particularly wealthy, then I will capture that in my analysis. And then the, the other fixed effects as well, uh, birth decade by birth district. So it's still within birth group, but across name variation that I use. But now I can just link all immigrants, both male and female immigrants to my censuses and the results looks like this. So I can do it for the full sample and also for just the child sample that I have. So they just back off my results on this selection, on, yeah, on the prevalence of selection. Right, so, okay, moving on. Can, 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 I, can I ask a quick, a quick question on that? So when you, mm -hmm. say, when, when you say that the results are robust, uh, do you yeah. mean that they are all significant or that the point estimates that you get are similar across specifications? Yeah, they are significant and they don't vary uh, a lot. I should, let me just uh, check. I don't yeah, I, I'm, I'm I happy, I'm happy with that broad uh, okay, statement. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's just, <laughs> I can check yeah, later. Um, I'm, also, just... I'm, I'm updating the paper at the moment. I want to do one of these cool graphs where you have all of these, because I have so many robustness checks. I like those graphs or figures where you can see the point in like a, a graph and see that it doesn't move a lot. So yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. But I could also just uh, ask another question. Yeah. So it, is, is my understanding correct that it doesn't matter whether you yourself have an individualistic name? It, it, it's enough if one of your siblings has yeah. a name. Okay, okay. Yeah, so there is, just, so I can, separate, I can separate the effect. So there is, like, for instance, if I include households fixed effects, there is actually still a small effect, but, but the main commonness of names effect seems to come from the household. So there could be something about that you raise your children differently. For instance, like the firstborn will have to assume more responsibility and it's more important for them to fit into society. Uh, so you raise your kids differently, but it, the main effect seems to be from the household. Okay, so in, in the second part of my analysis, I want to look at uh, what determines who migrates when and under what circumstances. And I call this uh, the pioneer versus followers analysis. So what I do here is that I... Uh, add, so I, I conduct the same analysis, individual level analysis as before, but now I add the time dimension to my data set. So it will be a, a repeated cross section of the same boys uh, that I, I had before, because I know the year of immigration. So I have a sample, so I repeat the sample for each decade of the period, and then I let the migration status vary over these periods. So it equals zero if you never immigrate or before you immigrate and then equals one in the decade that you immigrate or after that. So I then regress that on, again, these proxies that I have for collectivism and also individual level controls, which are time invariant. But then I interact that with time varying conditions at the local level. So this would be the rate of past and present immigration from your local district, and also the number of frost shocks that this district experienced in this time period. So uh, there's a maximum of 40 frost shocks that you could experience because we know that this was the kind of agricultural shock that, the, that was most harmful to Scandinavian agriculture at this point in time. So what you see in this table here is that you still have the overall selection of people with more uh, uncommon names. So just disclaimer, from now on, I'm only looking at uncommon names results, but I can replicate them for the other proxies as well. Yeah, this is just to reduce the number of numbers that you get to see. So you still have overall uh, selection of uh, individualistic types, but in, in, in times or in decades and places with more immigration and more past immigration, selection is weaker. So you have more collectivist people who follow. So this makes sense because now you can follow other migrants or join other migrants abroad. It's also weaker in times and places with uh, more frost shocks, which also makes sense because first these frost shocks spurred immigration on their own, which has been shown in other research. And uh, second, they also, they would have uh, impacted the relative a cost of, of immigration for these periods, if you of for these people, if you include this co this social cost of uh, migration, right? So so these results can be backed up with 
evidence from the passenger list themselves, where I, across all of the migrants in my passenger list, also see that people who had more common first names, they actually tended to immigrate collectively. So they would immigrate with family members, with other people from their hometowns, even on the same boats. Or if we know from Norway, their stated purpose of immigrating. So people with more common first names would say that they were joining someone abroad rather than say that they were leaving to create a better life for themselves or find employment. Right. So the third part of my analysis looks at what happens in the US and I will go over this a little bit quickly. So what here is, or what I do here is look at a cross section of Scandinavian immigrants in the US in 1900 and 1910 census. And then I look at assimilation outcomes. So whether they marry individuals of the same nationality after arrival in the US, so not whether they came with a spouse, but whether they married afterwards. And then I look at the number of people in the county that they choose to settle that carry the same nationality as themselves. And then I regress that on the commonness of the first names. And I have that for everyone in the sample. There's no need to link. That's also a, a benefit of using these names is that there's no, actually in this kind of sample, there's no need to link them to the actual Scandinavian censuses. That is only if I wanted childhood, the other characteristics of their childhood. Uh, so what we see here is that people with more common first names, and that is common in Scandinavia, they tended to marry people of same nationality and also move to places in the US where there were more people of their own kind. And this is with a host of individual level controls and also I can look at state fixed effects and entry or year of entry fixed effects as well. So compare migrants came in the same year, right? Okay, so the idea with this analysis is to sort of see that uh, how do these people behave when they're outside of Scandinavia and outside of the, where they're not impacted by the national social structures and national institutions. And what we see here is that they actually tend to replicate the same living patterns that they would have in, in Scandinavia. So this confirms that this can be something that's carried inside of them and not determined by some national structures in Scandinavia. Okay. So moving on to the last part, right? So the last part, uh, which uh, to some might be the most interesting part is now that did the cultural landscape in Scandinavia change as a result of selection in migration? So in the short run, uh, you would have a composition or change in the composition of these cultural traits as we know that more individualistic types tended to leave. So this is what I will refer to as the cultural shock of immigration. Whether this has long run effects depends on the strength of intergenerational persistence and also whether you have different cultural steady states. We know from other research that cultural traits tend to persist and I also do have evidence in my data that there is persistence of cross families and across villages in how you choose to name your children. So what I do in this analysis is that I get data from the world and European value surveys. So this is contemporary data. I get a measure of reported individualism, which according to the World Value Survey is the best measure of individualism that they have in the data. And then I link or I regress that on historical circumstances in this district of residence. So what I do is essentially to take two people in the current surveys or the, the value surveys that I have and then see if their cultural values are different depending on which subnational district they live in. And my historical circumstances here, they are taken from the earlier census that I have for each country. So this is, would be the, the commonest of first names of children in this earlier census. And then I construct or I approximate this cumulative cultural shock of immigration. So I calculate the percentage rise in first name commonness due to immigration between the census year and the end of mass migration. So this exercise is a bit <laughs> complicated and it involves uh, some assumptions, I construct different kinds of measures and use them as robustness checks in my analysis, right? And what you can see here is that looking across individuals in contemporary Scandinavia and regressing, uh, or you see that the reported individualism of these people is negatively correlated with the commonness of first names in the district that they live. So this is expected from cultural persistence, also because it's only a matter of generations, actually it's a matter of between 100 and 150 years, so it's not as long as 
since the Neolithic Revolution, as other research looks at. Then you have also that people who live in districts where you have a particular outflow of individualistic people, they also tend to be more collectivist today. So this is also in accordance with this idea that persistence was strong enough for this cultural shock of immigration to persist until today, right? And this is including different controls, also historical controls. But yeah, I'm happy to discuss this more, but I'm running out of time. Yes, um, sorry, I have a quick question. It's true that immigration induced a cultural shock, but it, it, it also induced a demographic and economic shock. So how do you control for this uh, other impact of yeah, immigration? So, okay, so yeah, so all of this is, this is suggestive evidence because I don't have an identification strategy for this part of the analysis. What I do is to control for stuff. I've been playing around with uh, trying to, like with instrumenting this cultural shock of immigration. But what I do here is, uh, uh, so if you have ideas, I'm very open ears to that. Uh, what I do is control for the rate of immigration. So the overall rate of immigration from the district. I can also construct measures of how the last names of these immigrants were different than uh, where they came from. Uh, or the, than the populations where they came from, and also the gender composition. So, I mean, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's still, like, I can't see how, so when I compare it with the rate or the overall rate of immigration, then, then like, this particular approximation that I do of the change in the commoners of first names, I can't see how that would correlate with other things aside from, like, this cultural shock of immigration that I'm talking about. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. So let me conclude. So in this paper, I document patterns of selection on collectivist traits in the age of mass migration. I show that Scandinavians were, with collectivist traits, were less likely to immigrate. And if they did, they were more likely to immigrate collectively with other people or follow other people and settle in places with people of the same descent. And then their departure generated lasting relative change was more collectivism in Scandinavia. So, sorry, I went over that part a bit quickly, uh, but happy to discuss uh, here in the Q&A. Yeah, so that's my presentation. Okay, so as a chair, I'm mostly a uh, keeper of time, meaning my role is, is done and Simone will take over because he has uh, it gets questions and, and yeah. Knows so there's a question by questions. Daniel Joel. Uh, I mean, uh, diaspora are generally considered as vector for promoting the culture of their host country in their origin country. Democracy uh, is an example. So given that many Scandinavian immigrants have migrated to the United States, why, he, which is a historical and individualistic country. How do you explain that Scandinavian diaspora have not had this effect of promoting uh, individualism in Scandinavia? Or, or this effect uh, was manifested in other ways like the organization of economics activities? So I don't, okay, so just correct me if I don't understand your question. I, in this paper, I don't link uh, this change in the cultural landscape to other outcomes, it would be interesting to look at. So there is uh, evidence that the, the age of mass migration spurred uh, democratic or spurred more social democratic policies in Sweden. I don't use those outcomes in my analysis. Was I, can you repeat the first part of your question? I mean, maybe I, I, mean, I didn't express myself well, but I wrote it on the I wrote my question, if you can read it, because I'm not very okay. good in English here. Okay, I will read it and then uh, I, I will get your name as well, so I can okay. contact you with, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, Ilel? Okay, I have two questions. One, uh, the first one I think is an easy one, and I'm sure you, you have the answer. Uh, about the long run effects, can you show they are driven not by overall migration, by the migration of those that are the pioneers or the, the, the effects are stronger when the, the, it's really a migration of pioneers and not of followers? Okay. This, the first question, I'm, uh, I'm not sure you, you have the answer because it's also uh, contingent on data. Uh, you said you have uh, data on the stayers, but you know whether the 
Tayers were actually internal migrants. You have information on international internal migration, because the what you can imagine is that, you know, people can uh, leave to the from rural areas, especially if you restrict the analysis to rural areas. Uh, they can go to the city or to the new world. And you would expect yeah. those who go to the city to be more individualist in a sense, yeah. because those who choose to go for farming, as many Scandinavians did, are maybe more collectivist in, in, in a way. So to the extent that these two types of migration can be correlated, how do you know that the results are not driven by the fact that the district that lost fewer people uh, actually received more people uh, from uh, other regions that were pioneers uh, but stayed in their home country and so on. So that's, yeah, thanks a lot. So that's a really interesting question. So I will uh, focus on what you asked right now. So I, I have some an individual level analysis where I look at internal migration as well um, and see that selection is weaker than the selection that took place across the Atlantic. I haven't incorporated that into the cross-district analysis, but that would be an interesting thing to do if that's, that's how I understood the last part of your question too. I have uh, ongoing work on internal migration in Sweden, where I, uh, with co-authors, I'm looking at how actually this selection of individualistic types into cities, how that can perhaps explain some agglomeration effects that we see in city growth. So that's for another project, but it's, I think that this distinguish, uh, the distinguishing between these two types of migration is, is very interesting. And there's also an explanation for, so Denmark had lower migration to the US than the other countries. And some people, an explanation for this is that you had already had a uh, migration internally and higher urbanization rates uh, in, in Denmark compared to the other countries. So it is part of the I mean, I acknowledge that as part of the possible outcomes of, of migration, so. Yeah, maybe I, I, I may add the last question and also congratulate you because it's really fascinating uh, analysis. Huh? But of course, your paper is uh, very close in terms of setting to the JPE paper by Karaja and Kravitz uh, on, uh, you know, selection uh, and, and unions and so on. So you, can you show some modern analysis, or maybe you do, about, you know, commonness of first names correlating with votes for the Social Democratic Party yeah. and these type of things? Do, do you do that? I haven't done it yet because I was also waiting for them to release their data. Uh, so it's something that I expect to do also as I'm updating the paper, paper right now, because I think that it's an interesting question. And also, we don't necessarily know the answers. It's not straightforward. You can have you can think of different hypotheses here. What I do show, uh, I have an analysis, so it's not in the paper, but I have it on my laptop, show that I can replicate their results with frost shocks driving overall migration. But on top of that, there is a large effect of commonness of names in the district. So it seems, uh, and also when you have large frost shocks, you have lower selection. So there are some interest, uh, an interesting discussion what this uh, weather shock driven migration picks up because it seems to not pick up overall selection. So of course, uh, you would like to course. shut down their, their channel. I mean, no, I don't No, I don't want to do that because I think that they have a very strong paper and- No, uh, no, no, I don't mean to, to, I mean to show that your mechanism that you put forth is coming yeah. on top of theirs. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I want to show because I think that there are complementarities there and I, it's something I would uh, like to explore. Yeah. I just don't want okay, to thank add you. I think I over... Uh, then um, now it's your turn. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I also, I concur with Hillel. This is absolutely fascinating work. But I was just wondering about the effect sizes. Um, so you show initially those selection regressions and we've seen those with other variables before. You know, there's Abramitsky and Bustan's work um, about Norway, for example, who have shown, for example, that there was a small degree of positive selection with respect to occupations or, you know, so economic selection or selection based on skill. So could you somehow benchmark your results or the dimension of selection that you are looking at relative to other selection criteria? Is this selection that you've uncovered here that is undoubtedly there, is this big or is this much bigger than the skills we commonly measure? 
and used to, yeah. to determine migrant selection or is it smaller? What, what, what is it? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I, I can't, I haven't benchmarked the results, but it's definitely something I should do. I like, I interpret the results in terms of standard deviations and then see that like when you have a standard, one standard deviation in, uh, in the commonness of names, for instance, within these first groups is associated with a, a 7% uh, higher likelihood or 10% higher likelihood of migration. But I mean, it's a very good idea, especially they also rely a lot on this birth order effect uh, and the possibility of inheriting. So younger brothers would be more likely to migrate. I should, and I check for that, but I haven't compared the, I should do that. That's a very, yeah, I should do that. Thanks. Thanks. Jesus. Okay, th thanks a lot for, for the paper. I also think it's a great uh, work. Uh, I, I wanted actually to continue on Ben's point on, on, on thinking about uh, other sources of selection. So I, I, let me be a, maybe uh, focus on, on one issue, uh, which would be the, the correlation between this uh, commonness of uh, names and income or, or wealth. Because I mean, I, I've read literature on the correlation between income uh, and wealth and the commonness of last names, but I'm not so sure about first names. Uh, so I see that in your regressions, you are controlling for socioeconomic characteristics. So yeah. I would like yes. to know a little bit more about, uh, about that. Uh, so which part of what you are doing here could be better controls for income, or you are absolutely sure that this is the, the cultural trace explanation that you are going after? Yes, I do uh, a lot to get at, at uh, ruling out these effects. But you do have that the more well, a higher socioeconomic status is correlated with more uncommon first names. So that's also like that's hypothesized in the modernization hypothesis that when you are richer, you are not you don't have to be that reliant on on your social group. Uh, so you are more free to pursue your own goals. Uh, so there is this correlation. So I try my best to control for as much as possible to rule out that that's driving my results. So for instance, with these occupation fixed effects of the father. So I, I get as close to comparing children who grew up in the same place and the same time and under the same circumstances. And also, yeah, I have a host of controls for that. Uh, I mean, since I, I use three different proxies and do a lot of robustness checks and also confirm that I, my other results are in accordance with this cultural interpretation that it also matters for when and how you migrate, and then also linking it to modern outcomes or modern survey data. Uh, like all of this evidence together, it makes me quite certain that this has to do with culture and not uh, socioeconomic status. So of course I can't rule it out completely in my individual level regressions, but I mean, a lot of the paper is trying to, yeah, to show that this holds in all, all ways possible. So yeah. Thanks. Tommaso? And oh, can I just add that that would also Sorry, go sure. against, can I, that would also go against the negative selection that has been documented in other work. So if this was a result of, of a higher socioeconomic status, then that would be uh, contrary to the evidence that we have uh, from, for instance, Abramitsky and Bustan and Ericsson. Uh, right. Okay, thanks. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is a, a clarification question. When, so in your, uh, to measure individualism, to construct your, your index of individualism in your, the last part of your paper, I, I seem to remember that you use a variable on gender equality. So uh, I don't understand how this yeah. is related to individualism. No, it's not. So this is, uh, so this is, I actually don't have the robustness check here. I'm so sorry. But uh, so this composite index is, uh, in, is in, yeah, a composite index of attitudes on autonomy. So whether you value independence or, so it con consists of, of four components. One of them is uh, gender equality, which is also, like, they, they argue in the World Value Survey that it has to do with uh, that, you, that all genders should be free to pursue their own goals, but it, it consists of freedom of voice, attitudes and freedom, freedom of voice. So whether you are free to express your own political views, for instance, and then another component is tolerance towards different ways of life. But the most important component here is a value of personal autonomy. So that is whether you value independence or obedience in child rearing. So they have this set of questions where you have to pick out 
uh, characteristics that you like your kids or your child to have when they grow up. And this is actually what's driving this result. So it's not, if, if I regress it on just gender equality, there's no effect, like the strong effect is on autonomy and also like tolerance for different ways of life, for instance, to uh, tolerance of, of homosexuality and stuff like that. So I agree that it's not a perfect index. I just wanted to tie my hands and not like run regressions where I pick right. uh, uh, the best indicator, but uh, according to everything that I would expect, it is like this value of personal autonomy that is driving this result. Okay, thanks. And uh, the second question has to do with your measure of uh, link commonness that, uh, so if I remember correctly, you measure, basically you define at the uh, municipality level, right? So, or uh, at the it's local like the level. level. Yeah, so no, I'm no, wondering no. whether this, so to the extent that there is a uh, regional heterogeneity in uh, commonness or name, which is what you want to correct for, you're not picking up basically internal, internal migrants. So if I migrate from one region to another and I carry over my typical traditional name from my region of origin, then based on your measure, you classify me as a individualistic, but in fact, I'm just an internal migrant and this in turn may increase my, will, my propensity to migrate. So, so, so I, I this do this based on the place of birth. So it's based on play, uh, birth, uh, district of birth. So it, I would uh, classify you as collectivist if your name was common where you came from. Um, and then in my individual level analysis, I can also control for past migration behavior. So I can have dummies for if your mother or father was foreigners or if they were born in a different district as yourself too. So, uh, so I, that's obviously in some work on these names, this is not something that people take account of, but it's obviously very important. So it's, yeah, I, I, I control for all of that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lea, last question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I noticed looking at the list of uh, names that uh, were mostly biblical names. And so I was wondering if you had information on the religion, religion of individuals, because if that is the case, uh, I wonder whether your results really uh, hold within religious communities. Thanks. So everyone, so the, you have uh, some of the first migrants in this time period were religious minorities that I actually don't have a lot of data on, so they're not part of my, my sample. All of the others, they were Protestants, so you don't have a lot of variation in, in religious denomination in this place and period. I have once uh, had uh, dummies for having a biblical name. I took it out, but I can put it in again. So it's not driven by names that appear in the Bible. Um, and these also tend to be more collectivist names because the church at this point in time was sort of preaching some of these collectivist values in Scandinavia. So it's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's not something that's driving uh, these results. One last question by Chaler. Yeah, hi. No, this is, I agree with everybody. It's an excellent paper. Uh, fascinating. And there's so much more you can dig in. I had a question uh, since you can track individuals over time. I assume you can calculate mortality, right? Especially child mortality. Do we see some, I mean, that would be at that time, a big indicator of social status and mm -hmm. all the other shocks you're facing. Do we first have any correlation with mortality and the commonness of the name? I and then been. can we use that as an instrument for something else of all the other things you're talking about, especially in terms of the, and, it, and the impact of mortality, if there's a child death in the family, it can go either yeah, yeah, way, yeah, impact. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not something I have a lot of information on. I do sometimes know if they, the sense, because the census is, is made on, or recalls living individuals. I, I mean, I could, that would, then I would have to link families over time and then mm -hmm. see if there's a child missing that would have been below the age of 10, for instance. I mean, I can do this for a subsample, like a very small subsample, mm -hmm. I think, but it's something that I could definitely actually do. Yeah, okay. I could check Thank that. Well, Ilan, do you want to conclude? Yes, so I'm concluding. Uh, we, it's 6.30, so we, we have to stop. I think you can stay uh, for, for a more private uh, meeting with the panelists. But for today, uh, we just thank you for the very interesting presentation and, and uh, look forward to your future work.